Hello, amateurs, and welcome back to another episode of the Amateur Rugby Podcast, here to help soothe your Sunday morning hangover with some wonderful rugby chat about the grassroots of the game. I'm your host, Tim, and I've got another amazing guest for you today. I met this man on a beautiful beach in South Wales. He showed me his massive trophy and sent me off with a bottle of water and a new pair of socks um, to explain all of that and loads more detail as well. Please welcome the founder of Beach Rugby Wales, Mr. Ashley Walters. Ashley, how are you? Hiya, Tim. Uh, thanks uh, for having me on. And I have to say, it's this trophy I showed you, not anything else. <laughs> the trophy Great is right stuff. there. And it is, as I described, massive. But we'll <laughs> we'll get onto that in some detail uh, later in the show. But uh, we'll talk about something that's quite timely at the moment first, Ashley, and that is the Six Nations squad. So you're there in Wales. What are you making of Warren Gatland's squad at the moment? Uh, well, well, obviously, there's a lot of new faces. We had some of the older older boys and uh, more experienced boys. They've uh, announced their retirements over the World Cup, etc. And some of the boys have gone uh, topping up their pensions out in Japan. So, uh, yeah, there, obviously, there are a lot of new faces. And, you know, it's... It, it could be a turning point like back in back in the 80s uh, after after the boys from uh, the great years of 78 etc you know all finished around the 80s it was a bit turbulent so it could be looking like that this year really um but obviously you've got Gatlin there as a coach and his uh, backroom staff hopefully they when, when the boys are in camp they can uh, Get the best out of them, ready for the uh, big match against Scotland in uh, Cardiff in two weeks. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you got the right man in charge there. I think having you to um, to try and bring these players through and get them the experience they need to be able to compete well on a international stage. Let's talk about you now, though, Ashley. How did you get started in rugby? What were your sort of first steps? Well, November the 11th, 1987, I always remember, I didn't even have to write that down, it was uh, Wales versus USA Eagles in uh, the um, the old National Stadium, uh, the Arms Park, although it's not the Arms Park, because that's Cardiff's ground. Uh, yeah, so I went there, Wales were playing in a green, green top with a red collar. I do love my rugby collars, so uh, I all... I do remember that. And Wales won 46 nil, old school scoring, four points a try. And uh, it was it was Tony Clement's uh, debut match as well. I went there with my dad and uh, I was in the terrace up against the railings. And uh, I think think the match, the tickets cost around two pounds to go to watch <laughs> uh, a rugby match and like an autumn, autumn international. Uh, but yeah, I always remember that. And then, I loved I loved it so much. I I asked mum and dad could I play rugby, and the only rugby club in the area that uh, had a junior age group was Pennebank Tigers, Tiger Town, and uh, I went down there, and it was a great coach called Terry Tum, and uh, he took us under his wings, and I wanted to play hooker, and I I was only I must have been around well eighty seven. I was was it I was nine. But the the age group was under 13, so I was absolutely tiny. And uh, I remember playing playing my first game against Skewin in the hooker. I went on as a replacement, and I had a boy called Matthew Moynihan here and Emmy Thomas, both props. And they were bigger boys. They were a good two years older than me, and I was really small. And I was so small, I couldn't, I couldn't go over. So I went, I went rugby league style underneath them. And I remember the first scrum I had, I, uh, I won against the head, against Skewen in, in Pennebank. And I absolutely loved it. Then uh, I realised forwards aren't for me, right? Let's get out in the backs, you know. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I enjoyed I enjoyed uh, starting rugby with Pennebank. And I had a good journey with Pennebank. And it, it's it's a great family club. It's so what's club. um what what made you want to play hooker? Do you remember what the what the uh, motivation was? I th- I think at the time when what do you call it? Hook had always had a ball thrown in the line out, and I think that's what we used to see on the TV the most. And uh, I saw 
at, at that international I went to, the first international, uh, Ian Watkins from Ebu Vale, he was a hooker, and I thought, right, I want to be like Ian Watkins. And then uh, I started then, I I saw Jonathan Davis playing and stuff like that, and I thought, he's, he's just a magician. So I went into outside half then uh, with Penderbank through, through the junior setup, and uh, yeah, it's great. That's a that's some transition. Hook hooker to fly off. Well, um, it, uh, what what can't you have a ball in both in it? You have a ball in your lineup, <laughs> and then you know you can control the game a bit better. I don't see that flow. I think. So tell me about tell me about you as a player, as an outside half. What were your what were your strengths, Ashley? What what kind of game did you like to play? Oh, I used to enjoy running the game. You know, I although I was small, I was a bit like Jack Russell. I enjoyed the contact and uh, the physicality. And uh, yeah, I I was all right. I was okay. I don't want to blow my trumpet, but I had a good boot. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, well, that's it really. <laughs> <laughs> so um, did you go on and play uh, adult rugby as well? Yeah, yeah, I went, I went through all the age groups and then uh, from uh, from school then in the first fifteen, I went in into youth rugby, uh, which which is great because there's not many youth clubs left around now. And uh, I played, I played for Armford Youth. That was my first rug, rugby match. I I just just turned sixteen, and we played against the second fifteen for Armford. And um, yeah, it was it was a great ped, it, it, it was a great stepping stone to go into senior rugby. And um, you know, it's like when you're in youth, you're playing against boys 19 years old and compared to playing 16 years old against 16 in school, you were, you were playing against the older boys. And when you were a young youth player going going against an older youth club, it was uh, it was pretty tough because obviously they were well bled and experienced uh, because of obviously the physicality back then was a bit more... Well, the rules, the laws weren't as stringent as uh, they are now. And uh, I think some referees that I played with did have eyes like me, you know. It's, uh, it's about, no, it, it's good. It's it's a good learning curve. And then I went to uni and I uh, I captained the university side. And uh, I was fortunate enough then to go on a trial in uh, university for the Welsh universities and uh, for the final Five Nations in 1999. And I was selected in the squad, and uh, yeah, it was good. Amazing. So what was that like to... So did you go on and represent the country? Did you play? Yeah, yeah, what call we did We did the Five Nations. I was in the squad, and then I, I went on uh, went on against Scotland up in Gala Shields. And uh, yeah, I you know I enjoyed it. And it's, a, it's always an experience when you're representing the country. You know, it's... Uh, is it's it's something that you want to achieve. Like my granddad, my granddad back back in the day, he bought me when when I was a kid, he bought me a Welsh rugby top, and that was that. It was great. And then he told me, he said, "That's the last top I'm buying you. If you want one, you need to earn it." So uh, you know, I didn't have a Welsh top then growing up. I I just had club tops, but then obviously when I was in the uni, then to get the Welsh top. It was fantastic, you know, and uh, it's now I go back, like on internationals, I'll wear a traditional classic retro Welsh top with a collar, no sponsors, because t- to me, I think the boys that wear those tops, are, they're the ones that have earned it, you know, and uh, so, you know, it's, it's always good to uh, try try to have a dream and achieve uh, that that goal, really. I think I think it's every schoolboy's dream, really, to try try to represent the country, be it Wales churches or beach rugby Wales or the proper national side. You know, it's uh, it's great. It is it is an achievement, and uh, like like the Welsh Uni kits, it was great. I they they gave us loads of kits, and then uh, obviously you can't wear it all. And uh, my eighty year old uh, grandmother was wearing my Reebok uh, trainers I had off a Welsh team. In the garden, you know, but uh, yeah, it's it's all good. Oh, amazing! So, what other sort of memories have you got from sort of growing up playing rugby? Any any touring stories or anything like that? The first tour I went on, uh, 
what was in in fact the first tour that Shane Williams went on as well. He uh, we went up. It was an exchange. It was we went up to Don Valley High School up in Doncaster, and uh, it was so it was new school year eight, year nine, old school form form two and three. We went up and uh, we stayed in family's houses up in uh, Doncaster, and then uh, we went up. We we. Went up on, I think it was on the Thursday. Went to school with them then on the Friday and played on the Saturday morning. But we went ice skating as well up in the Dome. The Dome is, it was Europe's largest leisure centre. And it had a split level ice rink. So it had a semicircle on the top, semicircle on the bottom, with a slope going down and a slope going up. <laughs> and obviously we were there, boys from Armenford, no ice rink in uh, in Amford or in Swansea, the only one was in Cardiff, and like we'd never been ice skating before, so we're all like, like a, then the the girls and uh, the girls from in, like Don Valley, because we had a school disco, they were saying, "Oh, we'll help you, we'll help you." So our balance were not great, just because they they were all used to uh, going uh, ice skating. But no, it's it, I always remember that, and I was up in Doncaster working a couple of uh, months back, and I remember driving past the dome and. It, it triggers, you know, it, it triggers your minds to old memories and you think, oh, bloody, I remember those rugby tours, you know, it's uh, great thinking about that. And then I was fortunate then to go on rugby tour to Canada twice with uh, my school. And uh, like, I, th- I think I timed it that my courses were finishing. So I finished my GCSEs and then I planned my A-levels and NBQs then to fall in with the the next tour and uh, went to Canada but 94, 97 and I'm still in correspondence with them now on the social media, you know the, the families that we stayed with and the clubs and the coaches that we met and it was, you know it's it's a great it's a great way of building friends r- rugby, that's what I find and uh, yeah it's, uh, I've got like went went in new new went went on lots of trips and tours and and stuff, but all all I'm thankful is is there was no social media back then. <laughs> Indeed, I mean I've heard of all kinds of things going on on rugby tours. <laughs> I've never heard of ice skating. Tell me, tell me a little bit more about that. Were were there some of the lads that like couldn't even stand up? Was somebody like oh, yeah. weird, weirdly good at it that you couldn't quite explain? Well, what called, obviously, because there was a slope in the Doncaster Dome uh, Leisure Centre. Some of the boys who were going down there, they were like a Jamaican bobsleigh team, you know, in, <laughs> in cool running. They were on the backsides, on the backs, going down. That's, that's why you had to gr- grab someone's hand, really, to say, I can't ice skate. And then they take you around and you had to dance in the next night in the school disco. <laughs> <laughs> it all worked yeah. out. It all worked out very nicely by the sounds of it. Okay, yeah, let's um, let's talk about uh, let's talk about beach rugby Wales. Ashley, tell me how did how did it kick off? Like, how did the idea come about? Um, yeah, how did it? How was it founded? Okay, so back in two thousand and six, it was it was around it was around July time in two thousand six. Uh, I was out jogging uh, with my friend. Uh, Ross Bowman and Howell Thomas. We were out jogging and we were, we were just jogging up uh, the beach because we worked in the building right by Beach Rugby. And uh, we thought, bloody hell, you know, you could have a great tournament uh, there because the natural sea defences looked like a stadium, hence Stadium Beach Rugby Wales. And uh, I said, come on, let's arrange a tournament. So at that time, we had a invitational sevens team called the Brahmas. And uh, we decided then to arrange this tournament. So we had six weeks. We decided, oh, let's do it on this date because we didn't have any games or anything like that. So we said, let's have a tournament. Didn't even buy a tie table. So we were just guessing it. So we sent out lots of invitations to teams. In the end, we had six teams turn up. And um, yeah, it was... It went, it went through to the final, and in the final, it was a team called Corinthiae Pontedaui, a team from Pontedaui, and Amman United Youth. And Amman United Youth, uh, obviously young boys, whippersnappers, they were pretty good and pretty fast. And in the final, because as I said, we didn't buy a tie table, if your feet were wet, 
you were in touch for tiders coming in so rapidly. And uh, Ammon United won it on a sudden death. So they were the in all, um, the youth team. They were the inaugural winners of Beat Rugby Wales. And then obviously, could have a success. I thought, right, let's have it next year. So bought a tie table this time. And uh, we had it. So it went from six teams to 11 teams. And then the third year, 22 teams. Fourth year, then 24 teams. Because that was the maximum capacity for the number of pitches that I had. And uh, after that then, in uh, 2010, I thought, right, let's introduce a ladies' tournament. And then we went up to 48 teams. So we did we did uh, men's and ladies' tournaments, 48 teams, including the veterans' uh, tournament. And last year, we uh, introduced the Rainbow Cup, which is a tournament for inclusive sides for the LGBTQ plus uh, community where they they are at, it is actually inclusive you play in the overall tournament and then the inclusive teams then will play in a little round robin uh, after they played in the overall competition to win uh, this uh, this trophy and uh, we so we've got in total is it is hang on I've, 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 I've I wrote it down because it's uh, it's, it's quite so we've got sent 48 teams battling it out six aside beside the seaside in Sunny Swansea Bay which is 76 matches over 912 minutes of rugby that's for over, just over 15 hours of rugby all compressed down to under six hours because of a tight. It's absolutely incredible. What a logistical task that is. How how is it? Has it just been like incremental gains every year where you've just kind of got better and better about organising everything and, oh, and being sort of regimented? Or how's it gone? I've got a great team of volunteers and, uh, you know, uh, helpers on the day. Uh, like the refer referees are all organised by a good friend of mine, Jason Griffiths. He, he arranges all the referees and, like, in the past, we've had Nigel Owens, Craig Evans, Ben Whitehouse, the international referees turn up. Uh, but, yeah, so Jason coordinates the referees and then we've got uh, we've got a great team of volunteers then who come down because, obviously, logistically, we can't fence off the, the pitch the day before because the tide comes in eight metres up to the steps. So if we did that... All, all the banners and everything will be over in Western Supermare and Il will across the way. So it's, uh, yeah, it's it is a bit of a logistical nightmare. But I I tend to do things myself, uh, do everything myself, and then just rely then on the helpers on the day. So at least I know the toilets are going to be arriving this time. This and then on the day I can just distribute uh, the work. The one one of the most important jobs. Uh, on the day itself is uh, the chief raker, the role of chief raker. Uh, that initially was my dad. Uh, sadly, he passed away, but uh, that his, his role was taken over by a gentleman called Duncan Price. Great character, great referee. And uh, literally, what Duncan and his team, because obviously if he's chief raker, he's got a couple of apprentices underneath him. They literally walk around in rectangles all day and with the rakes between the legs just walking like that making sure the pitch is marked out so like obviously without without the referees we can't have a game but without the pitch and without a raked pitch we can't uh we can't have a game so that is one of the most important roles going and then the lastly then obviously the volunteers at at the end we we try just to leave only footprints in the sand. That's our motto, you know. We go there when the beach has all been nice and cleaned with a with a tide coming in, and then at the end of the day, we just want to leave footprints. So we've got a great team of volunteers who literally we sweep the steps, and then pick all the rubbish up, and we get rid of all the rubbish. And with our recycling partners, the uh, Gavin Griffiths Group. Amazing. Talk to me more about the raking because I'm I'm interested about this. You described the technique. There. Was, it, was that coined by your dad? Did he work out the best the best way? And and uh... well, yeah, he he worked it out. If 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 you were just pulling like that, 
if like obviously you couldn't really see sometimes the lines would be wobbly so what my dad used to do you start off at the cone and then rake between his legs as if he was playing quidditch and then he'd see the cone in the in the foreground and he just walked straight towards that and then the lines were perfectly straight i have to say he's a duncan price was his apprentice and duncan the first first line of the day uh sometimes it isn't straight i think it must be a bit of sand on his uh, glasses but then he, he he gets it he gets it sorted so duncan he he does he does a good uh good job now he's 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 a great guy, great character. Everyone loves Duncan. And whereas we will all at the end of a at the end of the day, we'll all go back and have a shower in the house or in a hotel or whatever to go out in town. Duncan will have a swim in the sea. He'll have, he'll have a swim in the sea and uh, then he's all ready to go out and have a few beers. Good to go. Good for Duncan. Okay, let's yep. talk about the games themselves, Ashley. You mentioned it's six aside. Is there anything else that's kind of different or any kind of sort of rule it, differences it, for the beach it's, it's six aside physical touch. I, I say physical touch because a lot of the teams that come down, like we get teams from all over. We had teams from Holland. We've had teams from France, Dundee, up in Scotland. And like they all come down on the 15 aside teams, really, having a team bonding day down at the seaside. So they used to play in 15 aside touch rugby, kind of touch rugby league that you would play warming up at at your normal training compared to the actual touch leagues where it's if you touch, you have to stop straight away, whereas there's a bit more leniency with travelling, etc. And so sometimes one, one or two of the players might forget they're in the touch tournament and they might put the tackle in or just a little bump with the shoulder, but then that's what the referees are there for, you know, to pull them up on uh, their rule, laws, etc. Yeah, okay. So you mentioned there it's uh, most clubs or teams treat it as a kind of team bonding event. So talk to me about the atmosphere that's there on the day. Is it like a big party all day or are teams taking it seriously? What's the, what's the kind of atmosphere? Well, Judging, judging at the start of the day, when you see the teams walking down the promenade and they're all in the skin tight tops and vests, you think blinking neck, they're professional boys, they're professional outfits, and then they uh, they they are just there for a nice nice day, a nice a nice day at the seaside, and we 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 do warn and we say, right boys and girls, you know the sun is out, put some suntan lotion on, and they're there in their vests, and there's a breeze coming in, and they're not feeling the burn. But you can see the burn, you know. It's uh, but yeah, it's uh, some some teams do go there to win, and uh, some teams just go there for a laugh. Like I think it was around the third or fourth year, we had a team turn up, and their kit was two twos and uh, high visibility vests. Whereas, and then there's some then in the skin tight uh, numbers, you know. It's uh, I like half time one of one of them might do a funnel or something like that. But we've we've nipped that in the bud now. Where, doing the funnel at half time because obviously we're there to play rugby and uh you know if if you want to have a drink or something like that you can you can do that as a spectator not not as a player yeah nobody nobody wants vomit on the pitch either really do they so uh no. probably probably wise <laughs> so that's correct yeah um and tell me about the spectators then is there do a lot of people come and, and watch it is what it got. It is very much weather dependent. Uh, fortunately, touch wood, we've been uh, we've been fortunate with the weather. Um, if it, if it's a nice day, we could have around four to five thousand people there. So if the steps are all full of uh, spectators, it's because we'll have around five hundred plus players. And like we we did have a team uh, from uh, the valleys, Porth. I think you, you visited Porth on your jog, and. Uh, they come down and they'll bring four teams and then they'll bring around another two buses or three buses full of spectators. You know, Porth would have been empty on that day. And, uh, you know, they all they all come down, they enjoy themselves. And, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it is a great event. It's, it's a festival of rugby, it is. And, uh, and everyone enjoys themselves and they'll all have a sing-song. And, like, uh, there's a player from Porth, Aid. He... Uh, 
he loved to sing songs. So I'd have a microphone at, uh, on the tannoy, and next thing he'd come up and he'd want to sing uh, various songs, Sweet Caroline, and, uh, you know, and he, he used to get uh, the audience going. The police officers are there dancing, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's great. Amazing. So um, I'm just thinking through some more logistics here. And does the local like supermarket or off license have to get extra stock in for that weekend? Uh, I'm I can't uh, I can't really comment on on uh, what to call it the, the trade etc. But I think uh, I think they do well looking at the number of shopping trolleys that are left in, in the car park. So yeah. Yeah, let's talk about the trophy. It's right there next to you. And for those watching, there's no perspective trick here, right? It is as big as it looks. Talk talk about it, Ash. Why did um how did it come about and why did you make it so goddamn big? Uh well, what got I wanted something unique. Uh a lot a lot of uh, people like obviously the trophy cups and cabinets of they're a bit of resin plastic or tin or something like that. So uh, I wanted something nice uh, for the teams to lift in the, and they uh, they are this. So this is uh, Redwood Sequoia and it was made by a man called Harry the Hatchet. But he didn't use a hatchet. He, he used he used a chainsaw. So he, he uh, yeah it was it was made using a chainsaw. Uh, it is 35 kilos in in weight, which unofficially it is the heaviest, world's heaviest single piece trophy. It is. Uh, but it's, it's unofficial because Guinness World Records wanted around 1,500 pounds to verify it. So I, I thought... I'm not. I'm not paying that. And I've I've read the Guinness World Records for the heaviest trophy, etc. And the heaviest trophy in the world is the Davis Cup tennis. Uh, but that's in two pieces. So you've got the plinth and the cap. This is one piece. Yeah. Uh, so like the Stanley, this is heavier than the Stanley Cup as well. Wow, uh, really? The Stanley Cup, top, massive. yeah. Yeah, so the Stanley Cup's big, but it's in two parts. This is a single piece. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's nice. Unfortunately, the teams don't, because, because we've got seven competitions uh, on the day, so we've got the men's championship and plate, ladies' championship and plate, the veterans' championship and plate, the rainbow cup and the fair play. So we've got eight competitions on the day. Um and there's only one trophy, so they all can't take it home. So this is my doorstop, really, uh, in the hallway. Uh, the the brass the brass plaques are, uh, on the sides saying uh, the teams, etc. They've all been taken off to get uh, refreshed and uh, engraved with last year's uh, winners. But yeah, so they they don't take this home. They love their photos, and you know everyone can have a photo with it. But then they will take home. Uh, some uh, lovely Welsh slate trophies, like a big, big slate, uh, lump of slate by Valley Mill, uh, and like they, they, they are unique. You know, they're bespoke and they, they look nice rather than a piece of plastic in the, in the trophy cabinet. A nice bit of Welsh slate in the trophy cabinet with this photo. Uh, you know, with a captain lifting that or a team photo lifting that. You know, it's it's nice. Yeah, very appropriate, very appropriate. So tell me, we've, we kind of talked about the format, the trophy that people win. How competitive does the rugby get? Does it, you know, do people really, you know, come there to win? <laughs> yeah, uh, people do uh, People do want to win. And obviously it gets competitive if if you're running on the sand for six hours, you know, it's uh, your legs get tired and you want to make a last uh, tackle stroke touch. And it, it does get competitive. In the past, you... You, we've had a couple of handbags, but you know that—that's just what you have on uh, the, the grass, really, at, at every rugby club, nearly on every Saturday. You know, even at junior level, sometimes you'll have a bit of handbags. But uh, you know, it's done and dusted. Once a referee blows his whistle, you know that's it. At the end of a match, everyone's friends. Yeah, you want it to be competitive, don't you? Because yeah. you know that's why that's why we play sport. That's why that's the bigger allure of it for many many people. And yeah. 
has it has it kind of like created any superstars? Has anybody sort of come through and been like just a, ma- a magician on the sand? Yeah, well, I, I have to say, uh, back in 2012, was it 2012? Is either no, no, back in 2014, uh, our team beat rugby Wales uh, is run by a gentleman uh, called Michael Owen and John Baptiste Brusley, and uh, they they all went to the Bristol Academy, Bristol Rugby Academy, in uh, in in Filton School, and uh, we we used to have a lot of uh, Bristol boys. They they used it as a what do you call it? Like a get together every year. And one day this this boy turned up and I thought, oh, he's, he's a big boy, pretty fast, good player. Ellis Genge. <laughs> Ellis, I have to say, he, I, I've, got, I've got footage on the YouTube of, of our 2014 tournament and his, it was in the final and it was a, a player for the Welsh Wizards was absolutely sprinting. He passed everyone. He sprinted all the way down to... Uh, like just about to ready to score, and all of a sudden you could just see a steamboat belting down across the sand. Ellis Genge running, just had he went to dive. Ellis Genge caught him, and like he said, he saved the try. And like unfortunately, that team, like the team went on to win the final in the end. It, it went down to sudden death in that final. It uh, it went down to two versus two. So obviously, it's, it's six aside. But when full time goes in the knockout stages, you get uh, you get a player taken off every minute, and it went down to two against two on obviously the pitch. And like when there's six of you on a pitch, it's not that big. But when there's just two of you against two, that that pitch is big. And uh, yeah, so it dropped down to two versus two, and unfortunately, my team beat rugby Wales. They lost. But uh, yeah, we've so we've had Ellis Gens. We've also got the the Connacht player Joe Joyce, he, he he was uh, he was the king of Mead, Bristol, and then now he's 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 playing uh, for uh, um, Connacht out, out in uh, Galway. Uh, so we've we've had them, we we've had those boys play. We've we've had a number number of boys come through, and uh, in in fact, the rugby trainer Ben John, he, he he's played a few uh, games as well in the tournament. And uh, the late great Jerry Collins as well. He he's played at the tournament as well. Wow, what a list of names! That's <clears throat> excuse me. That's um that's amazing. Uh, so I mean, what I'll do for the listeners is I'll go and find that uh, YouTube clip that you mentioned of Ellis Genge, and I'll link that down in the show notes below so people can find it nice no and easily. Uh, what about any kind of uh, six aside on the sand uh kind of specialists has anybody you know really excelled at, at the game itself yeah i think well what to call it we've um we we we've had this uh in t- 2010 we introduced the ladies tournament and uh this young lady from uh seven sisters she came down and uh she was playing and she was amazing it's good it's good called keely and uh, she's taken part now. She's played for, played played in the tournament for many many a time now. And out of thirteen attempts of winning the tournament, she's gone home with twelve pieces of silverware, be it championship trophies or uh, plate trophies. Uh, yeah, Keely is a uh, she is queen of the sand. She she's the most successful uh, player out of the men and women. To be at uh, to be at Beach Rugby Wales. Wow, what an MVP! And what's her what's her kind of skill? Is she super fast? Is she skillful? Can she sidestep? What's the what's her sort of she style of play? What do you call? I've only seen her play on the sand. Really, she plays uh, for Burryport. She plays for the Blacks. She does. Uh, but yeah, she's a uh, she's an all rounder. She's got the speed. She's got the step. And uh, I got there, there's a great montage of photos. She's she's there running. To score a try, she's in the first photo. She's wearing sunglasses. Next photo, she's got the sunglasses in the hand, and as she's diving, the sunglasses are in that hand, and the ball's in that hand, and she, she scored the try. You know, it's a uh, it was a gr- great couple of images uh, captured by Riley Sports. Yeah, that's amazing. Okay, cool. So, what about um, what about this year's tournament coming up, and and sort of future tournaments? What are your what are your plans, Ashley? Right. Uh, 
Unfortunately, we can only do one tournament a year. Uh, the tides are only suitable for summer run. There's only one tide suitable, which will fall on a Saturday throughout the summer period during off season. Uh, so this year's tournament is on the 20th of July, uh, with a kickoff at around half past 10. And the final then would be around five o'clock in the evening. Um, so uh, we've got limited spaces available. We've got, as I said, we've got the men's tournament, ladies tournament, the Rainbow Cup and the Fair Play Award. The Fair, the Fair Play Award is uh, for mixed ability sites. So we uh, we re- try and, and we're trying to reintroduce that. So the previous winners have been the Swansea Gladiators, who are there every year, and then they've also uh, the old uh, the Clannechley Warriors have also won it as well. But it'll be nice to get the mixed ability sides back at the tournament, so that's why we're reintroducing this tournament. They'll they'll play in the overall men's format. Uh, so there's although you're entering for the Fair Play Award, there's the opportunity then to get into. Um, to progress into either the plate or the men's championship as well. So there's three opportunities to take home uh, silverware rather than just one. Plus, it's mixed ability, but rugby is inclusive for all. So, you know, you may as well play against uh, inclusive sides. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, I, I mean, I'm just thinking through like, it can't get any bigger, can it? Because you just haven't got the capacity in terms of tide Lo- and space. Logistically, like, We've got we got four pitches over a 250, 260 meter promenade area where we've got the steps. We could take we could take take it down to get say another two pitches, but then the sand is going a bit softer and there's a bit more of a gradient on the sand. Um, but logistically, for the spectator from a spectator point of view and uh, scoring systems and the referees etc. and Tannoys really. It's nice just to have a four a lot along that promenade. Um, I could, you know. So I think I think it's enough. I think forty eight teams, eight tournaments. You know, I think that's enough uh, on the day itself because we can't roll it over to a Sunday because obviously the tide is different, and we'd have to reset all uh, the pitches etc as well so we can't really move it on to a two day so it is a one day event but i have to say it is a good one day event yeah now talk to me about the sand itself because you kind of mentioned it might get a bit soft at yeah. one end of the beach and stuff like I, when i was there i just looked at it and i thought wow yeah i can see people playing rugby there because it looked flat and firm and so is that yeah. kind of the idea it's flat and firm to start for the first day round and then, obviously, because everyone's uh, running on, is turning up. So it is it is a live beach. Obviously, uh, at the start of the day, we will patrol the beach to pick any debris, or if 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 we see big shells or any bits of fragments of glass or whatever like that that could cause an injury, we will pick that up. But once the sand's been turned up, you don't know if there's any other shells that have been pulled up. Uh, so we do advise players not to play barefoot. We advise them to wear trainers or uh, or astroturf boots, but but no studs because obviously some some players might at their own risk will go barefoot. And uh, obviously, if you get a stud on that, you know it could hurt. So we do we do try to get uh, players to wear trainers. As I said, throughout the day. Within the pitch, it's all tuned up. Duncan and his team are raking around to make sure you can see where the lines are. But um, yeah, it, it at, at the start you think, "Oh, this is easy," but towards the end of the day, when you've been running on loose sand, it's just like doom running, really. You know, it's uh, people do complain about the uh, cramping up in the calves. Yeah, I can only imagine. Like, I find it hard enough running anyway, let alone on uh, yeah soft sand. So, um, yeah, amazing. It all sounds it all sounds fantastic and lined up for another great tournament this year. So, Ashley, let's move on. Let's move on to the stash section of the uh, of the show. So, Ashley, what's your what's your favourite bit of stash that you've ever received? 
Uh, I think the f- favourite bit of stash that I ever received, as I mentioned before, my first overseas tour was uh, to Canada and we had loads of uh, kit uh, for Canada and I still got it up in my memorabilia box upstairs. You know, it's, uh, yeah, it's I th- that and I think the Welsh Uni uh, kit then that we had off of WIU, that's, uh, that, that was nice. You know, it was, we had in abundance. It was, it was just so much. They said, they said, here's a pair of trainers here, here's a pair of boots. Here's a pair, another pair of trainers, just in case you need another pair. Here's tracksuits, here's this, and it was great. And it was like, it was nice, ha- it was nice having them and passing them out then to your friend or you know, it's uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, that's uh, I think that and my beach rugby kit as well. Uh, like every year, every year we have uh, like like new beach rugby kit, and that is like Christmas. I get all the kit off Conqueror team where they like. I work with uh, Chris at Conqueror and he does. He comes up with some fantastic designs on the team wear kit, etc. And and the, and the players and refs kits. And then uh, you know it's it's great to have that and then distribute it then to the referees. You know, a lot a lot of tournaments will just say refs turn up or oh, there's a be about you. Whereas. Our tournament, the refs will have a polo shirt, they'll have the playing kit, they'll have a free bar, whatever. But it's always nice to have stash. Everyone loves stash, freebies. And when it, when a kit comes in from Conqueror, they uh, you know they just love it. So it's it's great to work with Chris uh, at Conqueror team where for uh, the beach rugby to get the favourite kits. Yeah, and it must be great, like just to have it look really professional, you know, for the referees to sort of like feel like they're you know part really exactly. really part of the tournament exactly is like i spoke i spoke to a lot of the referees uh, a couple of years back we had uh, some uh, team we, we had the team company give us uh, some ref shirts but they were absolutely skin tight and obviously the refs some, some of the refs enjoy your beer they're not all like uh, craig evans you know six packed up and uh, the, the skin tight tops weren't that great on them, but uh, you know they, they put up with it. But now we're working with Conqueror, now we've got a per- perfect fit for the referees. And uh, yeah, it's you know they they look a professional outfit. Good stuff. Okay, what uh, next question then? And the stash. What is your favourite kit of all time? So this can be any team from any era. I'd say my favourite kit of all time is the Stade Francais uh, kit from uh, two thousand. Uh, Adidas blue lightning stripes down the sleeves, across the arms, and uh, I was fortunate uh, to play against Stad Francais in 2000, and I uh, was given uh, Diego Dominguez's uh, number 10 shirt, and uh, yeah, so it was, it was great. So I got that in my memorabilia, and that was all. Stad Francais kit was always my favourite before uh, I, I played, and uh, yeah, it was uh, yeah, that is my favourite. Right, hang on a second. How did you end up playing against Stade Francais uh, and get I, that shit? Well, back in what was it? Back in ninety nine, two thousand, um, I was just finishing college, and I decided I wanted to play abroad. So I was flicking through the Rugby World magazine, and it said, uh, "Play play rugby in France, play rugby in Luxembourg." So I applied for both, and uh, the. The, this lady called Jane Pelo, she uh, messaged me back saying, Ashley, are you interested in playing in France? I said, yes. So they said, they called us out uh, to the Burgundy region in uh, Givry. And uh, they, they called us out there and they, I thought, it's a holiday for a week. You know, it's a free holiday. Let's get your tickets. So I jumped on the Eurostad Waterloo, went down, went down to France and... Uh, Met, met this lady Jane and her family put me up and uh, her husband uh, was uh, uh, an ex Clermont Ferrand uh, player or oh, Clermont Aveyron now and uh, his his name is John Paul Pelou and uh, literally I was out there for a week hardly touched a rugby ball just all fitness he had me running around the track and then uh, he had me holding on to a pole he's a pull up Hold it as long as you could. I thought, I am touched. I'm out here to play rugby. I haven't touched the ball. So um, they, they said, right, we'll leave you know in two weeks. Two weeks went by. Next thing, phone call again. 
we want you to come out and play a couple of matches. So I w- went back out there. I thought, I've got two weeks now, another two week holiday out in France. <laughs> so uh, they said, uh, I had five matches in two weeks out there. And uh, I always remember play- playing one match. It was 36 degrees in Givry in, in the Burgundy region. And uh, we were playing a team called Pontalia, which is right on the Swiss border. And uh, I was, it was a team called Cruz de Monchina that I was going for a trial with this 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 match. And uh, they were in the Pro 2. There were two teams that merged to make like a super club in the area. And so they were in the Pro 2. And uh, we went up, we were going up the Alpine roads and the trees are blowing a gale. I thought, oh, it's going to be cold up here instead of 36 degrees down in the valley. I got up to the top, blank, yeah, neck. It was... Must have been 36 degrees with a breeze like a warm hair dryer. It was unbelievable. So um, after that, then uh, they had uh, I had offers from four clubs. It was Dijon, um, Le Cruz One, Macon, and Chalon. They they offered us uh, contracts. The the best deal and the the best rugby quality of rugby was the Pro Two. So I was out there then for a while and. Is I was fortunate to play in the like in French Cup against uh, Stade Francais, but it was it was great because it was Pro Two, whereas a lot of teams quibble about driving two hours to a, a rugby match over here. Because it was a it was a poor uh, rugby club. We didn't we didn't didn't use a train or planes or anything like that. We we'd be on the bus, and we we could be on the bus for eighteen hours, you know, ten hours hotel, then drive to another club hotel, play the match, and then drive back. So to play a match on the Sunday, we'd have to leave, say, on the Thursday. And then we'd get back on the Tuesday. And I always remember we we played played a team called Oleron, which is a, a town in the Pyrenees. And I was 11 hours to get down there. And then the following week, we were playing Poe, literally 20 miles away. But we'd... <laughs> So we'd have another eleven hours to go down there, you know. It's uh, yeah, it was it was great because we we were playing all over France. One week we'd be in Nice, Montpellier, Po, Bordeaux, up in Paris, then you know, and uh, yeah, it was good. So I played there, and then after uh, after that, then I went to play for Marlow, then in uh, what Buckner. Yeah, and, okay, uh, that's yeah, not far from London, is it? Yeah, and then came home into Pennebank, finished my days, and. Uh, yeah, that, that's it. What an amazing French adventure. How how many seasons did you play out there? It were, it were three seasons out there. So that's that's why I like uh, the old start from sea top. <laughs> that yeah. is the most remarkable story to Sorry. get to a favourite kit that I've ever heard. Um, I want to dig into that a little bit more. Tell me more about the bus journeys. You must have got some real sort of good team bonding sort of on those long journeys. Uh, there, as I said, there was no social media, so I always remember uh, going out there. I took took a VHS TV with me. Is that uh, I, as I said, I was offered the contract, and I said, "Okay, I'll be back in two weeks. I'll go home, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back now in September. This is in July." And I said, "Is it? What do you mean go home?" He said, uh, "Season starting next week. Pre-season." And I thought, "What? Oh, okay." So uh, I. Picked up a phone. I said, "Man, Dad, I've been offered a contract. You need to bring stuff out." So they brought stuff out. So they brought my TV with a VHS on it, and they brought a couple of uh, Only Fools and Horses out, and uh, a couple of my David Campisi videos and the 1973 Barbarians against the All Blacks uh, match. So I always remember. We, I think we were off to tour, and I like in uh, on uh, in France and. I uh, put the video in. I said, there you are, boys. Watch this match now. I said, the greatest ever try. So, uh, obviously, they saw the Gareth Edwards. And, uh, yeah, I always remember watching that on the bus. And there was a lot of playing cards and a bit of banter. So, uh, like, like, we we used to stay in, uh, like, the Campanile-style hotels. And... uh, Every now and again, you'd be going to the same town as where there might be a professional cycling race and there's a bit of banter about the EPO boys and the Festina boys, you know, from uh, 
the Tour de France. And but like, yeah, it was. Uh, no, it was good. Enjoy, in, enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. And uh, obviously, it was an adventure for me. So I'd be, although although it was a job, it was an adventure. You know, boy from Wales living in France, going traveling around France, and I'd I'd always have a camera, not not a digital camera, you know, a camera with film. So I'd be take taking photos, etc. And I always remember one of the coaches said, "It's not all day, boy." You know, in in. <laughs> In French, he says, not all day, because I was taking, I said, well, how, many, how often do I get to go to a, stay in a hotel with a big swimming pool like that? Or we, we went to Nice. We, we played rugby in Nice, and uh, we stayed in uh, Cannes, where, where the film festival was. Yeah. And uh, we had, for that, that day, we did win the match. We like it's very rare, uh, and the way French team will win the match because of the crowd, they're quite partisan and stuff like that. And uh, we went, we went out in Corn that night, and we went to a nightclub. And uh, obviously, the the Nice that nightclub must have been where the Nice team uh, frequented. And uh, a few words were said, and we got to know each other over a bottle or two over our heads. <laughs> And uh, in in the end, uh, the, the club find us a week's wages. He, all all the squad got find a week's wages, and uh, yeah, one 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 or two of the players didn't didn't come home to the hotel that night. They stayed in the, the gendarme. Oh dear me! I mean, I know French rugby's got a a bit of a reputation, certainly historically, for being sort of somewhat barbaric. Was was that kind of your experience on the pitch as well? Well, on on the pitch, I was quite shocked because uh, my I. We played. Uh, we played in the suburb in Toulouse called, uh, called Balman. We, we, I went went on the pitch and I was playing scrum half then, and uh, there, there was a hand on the ball. So I, I decided to just give this guy a bit of shoe pie just to get his t- get him to take his hand off the ball. And uh, all of a sudden, the referee he, he said he gave me a yellow card. He said, "What's that?" He said, "Not in French rugby. No racking in French rugby." I thought, "No racking in French rugby." I said. On TV, you're kicking hell out of each other, you know. But uh, no, it was uh, it was good. It was good. It was good experience, and uh, it was my my first experience as well of using pine sap. Go on. In the changing rooms, when when it was wet, it's the the team uh, the forwards would put a bit of pine sap on their hands just to get a bit of grip. Right. So they said, I said, what's that? And they said, oh, it's pine sap. Oh, okay. They said it's good for the grip. I thought being scrum half in the rain, I thought, let's have a try. So I put on a bit. I, I, I've i never put pine sap on my hands before. And uh, I put on a bit too much. So put it on, went out to warm up, doing push-ups on the pitch. And all of a sudden, I they stood up and nearly took half a pitch. It was just full of grass and mud on my hands. I was like, before the match end, I had a scrubbing brush in the showers, trying to scrub off the sap. It was, it was The grip was unbelievable. But like the forwards just added on the fingertips so they could just get up and catch a ball, you know. It's uh, but yeah, I don't recommend pine sap. <laughs> okay, um, right. Well, there's still one more question about stash. I wonder how long this one's gonna, how many more stories we're gonna get from this. Uh, what is your what, what is an awful kit that you uh dislike at the moment that you'd rather see sort of thrown in the bin? South Africa's a wee kit. Oh. What's the Good point? Choice. What's the point? It's uh, it's like have it white, don't have it white and green, you know, or turquoise, you know. It's uh, yeah. Uh, at at the moment, like in the World Cup, I saw it. I thought, what the what an awful kit. Yeah, I mean, I personally agree, but I was I was at a few games in the World Cup, and it was <coughs> very it seemed to be very popular amongst the fans. There were there were loads of people wearing it at stadiums and stuff. Good marketing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good marketing. Absolutely. Yeah. Give, okay. Give, As we bring this to a close, Ashley, is there kind of, is there anything else you'd like to say? Any kind of closing thoughts or a call to action? Anything at all? Well, no. Well, well is uh, importantly, thanks very much, Tim, uh, for uh, inviting me to this podcast. And it'll be great to see yourself and uh, everyone else who listens on the sand in, uh, in Sunday Swansea Bay in July. Uh, 
whether a player or as a spectator, you know, everyone's uh, welcome. It is a rugby family. But yeah, it'll be great to to uh, to get as many people down there. And like possibly if you want to follow us on uh, the socials, that'll be great. At Beach Rugby Wales uh, on on most of the socials. And then like we, we I do have uh, I do have a YouTube channel where uh, you can do all the beach tour videos that I did during the COVID times. And uh, yeah, it'll be uh, it'll be great to see you on the sand. Perfect. And, and there's a hashtag there as well, isn't there, Ashley? What's the hashtag? See you on the sand. See you as in the beach. So it's a, that's a play on words. See you on the sand. S E A U on the sand. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. This has been so much fun. Thank you so much for your time and people listening at home. Everything that we've mentioned, I'll link down below in the show notes, which you can find. Uh, in one place, and that is at amateurrugbypodcast.com. So, Ashley, once again, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much, Tim. All the best, and then just have a great Six Nations. Oh, Tim. Oh, oh come Sorry. back here. Go on. <laughs> Can I uh, just uh, just mention about my uh, my good mates from uh, Scotland, the Jock Jacks? They're uh, oh yes, they're yeah. Go on. Yeah, the, the Jock Jacks is a is, is a group of guys uh, who met out in South Africa in uh, 2013 on the Lions tour, and uh, since since then uh, we've been we like they met my mate Mark in uh, Cyril, and since then we've become great mates. The Jock Jacks hashtag Jock Jacks, and uh, they come down every international. We go up every international, and uh, we also meet in between during uh, the year, and uh, they're great. We have. Uh, we are looking forward to it. You know, we we've got our shirts already, and uh, we we we've, we've got our buses buses planned. And you know, it is it is a one once a year. This is my Christmas do really. Uh, this this uh, this Jock Jack weekend, and uh, yeah, it'll be great to see the boys now in two weeks. Amazing. Uh, I mean, just like rugby friendships, it's uh, it's one of the best things in the world, isn't it? So yeah, that was brilliant, brilliant to share that. So. Um, We'll say goodbye now, Ashley. Thanks so much again for your time. Thank you very much, Tim. All the very best. ta Amazing. There he goes. I mean, what stories and what um, what tournament? I mean, I, when I arrived there, I was just like with the steps leading down to the sand, the massive expanse of sand there in beautiful South Wales. And um, yeah, I'm going to try and get myself along to uh, Beach Rugby Wales one of these years if not this year so Ashley thanks again so much people at home if you've enjoyed this podcast you can do all the social media stuff follow on YouTube write a review share all of that jazz but what I'd really like is if you mention it to someone in person the next time you're down at your local rugby club until then get out and play